Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Beyond the Track. This is episode 42. If you're catching this one for the first time, go to Supercross Live's YouTube channel. You can catch the other 41. Uh, I'm going to nerd out in this one because I'm a huge fan of Jamie Little, and we have a lot of things to talk about because you had your first uh, in something brand new this year. I had mine. Your start came where I am now, which is Supercross. So I have like so many nerd questions for you, Jamie. I'm sorry, but I'm going to drive you nuts <laughs> in this interview. Uh, but I just want to start and say hi and thanks for coming on the show. Daniel, it's awesome to be on. I mean, I don't get to do anything Supercross related these days other than just watch you guys. So I was very honored when you asked me to be on. So I'm excited to talk a little Supercross, go back in the day a little bit. I know, and that, that's going to be so fun because I got to work with Todd Harris this year a bunch, and we talked about you. I think we are in Atlanta, and he just told me about you guys working together, and it just like, for me, that was like the part of my racing when I was really like coming into my own, and you were there, and Todd was there. Um, I just I just think back to that time, and I just, I, I, just, I don't know. I, like I said, I'm just, I'm a big fan of yours and I'm proud of where you've gone and what you're doing, but it's going to be good to talk Supercross because I know you, it was a big chapter in your life and got to see you this year. I didn't see you in person, but I saw you on screen because we <laughs> know you were at a race. So I kind of got to see you this year, but I didn't talk to you. So. Yes. Well, it's cool, Daniel, everything that you're doing. Congratulations to you. I've been really proud to see you move up the chain. And I remember covering you, you know, you weren't one of the factory superstars. And I always love talking about the guys that didn't have that full funding, you know, somebody different to watch and to see you rise above everyone else and be able to do that job. It, it's awesome. I mean, there's nothing like being able to speak right from the heart, knowing it, understanding it, and then learning TV. I mean, and live announcing. I mean, they're all different skill sets and uh, you've done a great job with it. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate that. And I've been working hard and as, as you are, uh, I love the sport. And I, I, I think it's when you're passionate, like everything else can come together, right? You can cross the T's, dot the I's, but the passion has to be there. And if it's there, like it's going to be okay. And that's what I had to learn, you know, how, how to do this job, but I love it. I know you love it. I know you love what you're doing now. I mean, you're not even home right now and you're willing <laughs> to talk to me. You're in a hotel room. So first off, let's start there. Where, where are you and what are you doing right now as your season is just, I mean, you're going crazy. I'm done. See the beard? I'm done. Yes, you are, done. are, you're still going at it. So where are you? You've got the off season beard. Yeah, we are <laughs> wide open right now. NASCAR has been insane this year. Just, um, I'm covering all three NASCAR series, trucks, Xfinity and cup. I've never done all three before, but, um, that's a great thing. It's a compliment. I love being busy. I've always been a workaholic, so that's good for me. Um, right now, I'm in Austin, Texas. We're here racing at Circuit of the Americas. So it's a huge weekend for NASCAR. We've never raced at that track. And it's cool to come back to this city. I, I was telling you, um, back in 2014, I covered X Games. I think that was actually my last summer X Games. And I covered freestyle. I covered rally cross. And we were literally like in the middle of CODA. And so I'm one of the few that's really even seen the racetrack before. So this is a really big deal. And uh, I'm here a little early doing some other projects and charity things. So it's going to be a good week here. I, we're going to get into a bunch of things, but I just want to ask you, what, what, what is still driving you right now to take on as much as you do? Because you take on a lot, you work your butt off, you crush everything you do. But is it just the passion for the sports? Is it the passion for the job? I mean, what, what is driving you to still be just, just nailing and doing so much? Well, thank you. Um, yes, it's all about passion. That's what I tell people. You know, a lot of people along the way, especially recently, they've asked like, why have you stuck to motorsports? Why haven't you gone to football? Like that's where it's at. And I've always been true to myself. I never saw myself as covering something I wasn't in love with. I loved racing. And the reason I'm here doing what I'm doing is because I fell in love with dirt bikes. I mean, call it what it is. I was a 14 year old girl. I was a tomboy. I met Carrie Hart and Mike Metzger and those crazy kids. And off I went, I was like, this is the coolest thing ever. And I quickly realized when I turned 18 that, you know, I didn't want to go to college. I ended up going to college and getting my degree in journalism, but I didn't want to go to school. So I was kind of trying to figure it out. And I don't know what it was, but there, I just loved the sport so much and realized that there really weren't any women that looked like me that loved racing. So why couldn't I be that voice and that face? And that's literally how it all began. 
And again, it's led you to a lot of different things. I want to get into Supercross, obviously, um, but let's talk play-by-play. -play. You have been given an opportunity, crushing it, by the way. I did my own little research and asked, how's Jamie doing? <laughs> Everyone says, nailing it. So I wouldn't expect less, but um, how has that role been now doing play-by-play? -play? I mean, that's just, it's so much different, right? It's just a, it takes different responsibilities, a different style. And for you, this is a kind of a new venture for you. How, how has it been so far? Yeah, you know, and this goes back to your question about like, why do I keep doing it? Why do I keep working so much and taking on new things? And well, for one, I love it so much. And, you know, there's, there's nothing like knowing and understanding something and being able to deliver that to people at home. And if my bosses believe in me and want to see me go to that next level, then I'm always going to outwork the next person and prove that I'm the person for the job. And now ARCA is a whole new deal, like you mentioned. So ARCA, for those that don't know, it's a development series for NASCAR. So it's a national touring series that airs on Fox Sports. Um, so basically you go from ARCA and you'll move into the trucks or Xfinity series and, and get to cup one day is, is the ideal you know, situation. Um, but somebody called me, actually somebody at NBC, Lee Diffie, who's, you know, he's done NASCAR, he's done Supercross, he's done everything. He called me out of the blue last year and he was like, listen, I know you're going to think this is crazy, but every, you know, I'm seeing women move up to play by play in other sports. You need to be the one to do it in racing. And I was like, well, damn, you're right. Why don't I do it? And I literally called my boss that day and he called me back two weeks later and said, do you want to be the voice of the Arca series? And I was like, what? Like, I was just thinking maybe a couple practices next year to fill in for somebody to get my feet wet. I had never covered Arca before. It was completely new to me. And uh, so there we were, Daytona of all places to kick off to be the uh, first time a woman's ever done play-by-play -play for a national motorsport series, which blows my mind that that's never happened before. Um, so there was a lot of pressure, but it was incredible. I've done a few now. I'm doing eight this year. Um, it's just like, it goes back to what I said. It's a different skill set, totally different. You have to kind of, you know, change the way of doing things, but it's been awesome. I mean, I love getting out of my comfort zone and pushing myself. It keeps me hungry you know i think that goes for anybody no matter what your age is uh, uh, no question and then you, you talk about that hunger about trying to continue to get better and push and push you get this opportunity um the role is obviously a lot different the responsibilities are different you're really good at everything that you've done how did you prepare for this new role knowing that those responsibilities were so different in the same vein of what you do but the responsibilities i mean you just there's different t's to cross and different i's to dot <laughs> How did you prepare for that when you kind of got ready for that first one? Well, my main thing since day one in Supercross was talk to the riders, talk to the drivers, talk to the people that you're talking about, get it straight from their mouth and share those stories with your audience. And I did that with ARCA. I got to go down for a test and I literally, we went through the gamut from the 18 year old kid to the 70 year old that was racing in ARCA. And I got to know everybody. So I made notes on everyone. And once you're up in the booth, I mean, like I could tell the stories, talk about them, but I'll tell you when you're standing up in a booth and looking down and realizing like I'm in control of this whole deal. And like, it's up to me to like call the green flag, call the checkered flag, throw to break. All of those things are so different. And I think the hardest balance is to do it naturally where you're having a conversation, you're talking about the racing and then, oh, I've got to throw to this commercial or I've got to do this promo and you're trying to make it very natural and seamless. And I think that that's been a challenge, but when it comes down to the drivers, I just love learning about people, their backgrounds and being able to bring those stories. Do you feel that like if the, the stars of whatever sport, like there's a lot of information on them, the fans know a lot about them. So it's, it's sort of challenging, but sort of easy at the same time because it's easy to get that information. But when you go down the list to the new, the 18 year old rookie, to me, that's kind of where like the juice is, right? Because you have these stories that nobody really knows yet. You don't even really know it. They're kind of like developing before your eyes. Do you kind of feel that same way that when you talk to them and get their stories, that kind of drives the broadcast because that's that new info that nobody really knows. Yeah, that's what's been really fun about it because it's all been new to me. So, and especially for ARCA, and I think we had a new kind of audience that people were like, oh, what is this ARCA thing? We're going to check out and, and we're kind of showcasing who these people are and you're telling the stories of everyone. But perfect example is Ty Gibbs races full-time in the ARCA series. His grandfather's Joe Gibbs. 
And I heard a lot about this kid. He comes out and he puts a whooping on him, you know, like every week he's a threat to win. Well, he made his Xfinity debut at Daytona at the road course and won the freaking race. Nobody else really knew about him other than he was coach's grandson. I had all this information on him as a racer and how good he was and quotes that he said. So it's really neat now that I'm learning about all these new kids coming up because now I have their information as they cross over and move up the ladder. Right. And they do that, right? So you're getting, a, you're almost getting like the first uh, wave of like who could potentially be the next level star. So you're getting to kind of, I guess, bring them to light, I guess I would say like right at the beginning. And then is it cool though, when they go on to the next level and you're just like, like, I know where you started. Like I, you know what I mean? Like yeah. it's got to have spe a special feeling that way. It's all about relationships. As you know, it's, it's just who, you know, what, you know, how you respect each other. Um, that's everything. And as, as it grows and you grow together and you see them kind of flourish and they're standing in victory lane and you're like, I knew them when they got their first win at 18 years old. I mean, it goes back to like, um, you know, the 125 class when that was like the feeder series for the 250 class back then, I'm totally dating myself. Um, but that's how it was. Like you got to know those new kids that everybody, all the factories were eyeing and you got to tell their stories at Anaheim and then kind of follow them through the season. And um, those were the future superstars. That was so much fun for me. Cross and even into commentating in general. So can we go back there and kind of just walk me through those early days and just how it got started and then definitely how the Supercross careers got, uh, got started? Yeah, it goes so far back. So um, like I said, I kind of loved Supercross and I went up to a guy with an ESPN microphone at the finale in Las Vegas. I think it was, oh gosh, I'm trying to remember the year now. I think it was 95 or 90, 94, whatever Jeremy McGrath's rookie year was um, okay. when he won the championship. I think it was 95. Anyway, so I always got in trouble as a teenager. So um, I snuck out of the house and I went with some friends to Sam Boyd Stadium, went underneath the fence and got in line to get Jeremy McGrath's autograph. And he pointed me out, called me up to the front, gave me an autograph. And I was like, I'm, I'm cheering for that guy. He won the damn championship. And Jeremy <laughs> McGrath was the man in my eyes still to this day. So that's kind of how it started. Like, I mean, it had a lot to do with Jeremy McGrath and of course, Ricky Carmichael and just guys like that throughout. So, you're, so your career starts with you sneaking out of the house and sneaking under the fence. And uh, that's how it starts. Yeah, see, I tell my mom all the time when I took my horse posters down and put Supercross posters up, it will all work out. And it did, see mom? <laughs> see mom, I told you this would be fine, but obviously you had no idea it would accelerate like this, but where, so how did the TV, did, did you have an interest in commentating in TV even back then? Or was it just like, I like this sport, I want to be around it? Like, where did the interest in commentating and broadcasting come from? It was so organic how it happened. Like, I just, I never had intentions of like, this is where I want to go. It just kind of went there. And there was a guy who worked for, he owned supercross.com. So he's the one that I went up to with the microphone. And I was like, hey, you work for ESPN. I really want to do this. How do I get started? And he said, well, I'm, I'm local here. I cover all the local stuff for ESPN2 for Moto World, if you remember that old show. Yeah. And I literally would pal around with him on weekends and learn how to write. It was my hand in the shot doing interviews. And Feld, I think, uh, gosh, whoever, Roy, uh, I can't remember who was in charge of Supercross at the time. But they were looking for a new announcer to replace Leanne Tweeden. And I was like, I'm, I got to go for it. So people at Feld, back, it's now Feld, um, saw me enough and they're like, well, we know of you, but come, you know, come to Chicago, we'll interview you. So I went there, like I, I've never live announced. I was just around, I was learning my skills. They hired me, but they said, there's no contract. Like it's a one race deal. Like, we'll see how you do and we'll go from there. I'm like, okay. So we go to Anaheim for my first race, like lights out, you know, the whole show. I'm there with my microphone shaking, feeling like I'm going to throw up. And I remember 125 class and I'm like, yeah, keep your eye on David Pingree. He looks really good today. Like he's going to be solid. He came out and won that race. And I was like, <laughs> I know what I'm talking Told about. Ya. 
and I, and <laughs> it stuck. So I went on to cover Supercross as a live announcer for four years. I think I got paid like 500 bucks a weekend. And in the meantime, I started going to college because I knew like, I really love what I'm doing. And if I want to move on and maybe TVs in my future, then I need to get my degree to fall back on. So I would go to school during the week and then I'd fly to Supercross on the weekends. Wow, that's awesome. Did you did you work with Michael Prince? Yes. During those? Yes. Okay. Yes. Because I did too. So that's how my whole start came uh, from Glenn Selig doing Arena Cross. Michael Prince was in the building when I had my audition. And I'm super cool with Prince now, but he scared me in the beginning. <laughs> he was harsh in the beginning. Was I don't he? know how he was with you, but Todd Todd Gendro was my boss, and he was a little intimidating. But I liked I like getting through to people like that because I I've always been one to I want to prove myself. I'm going to prove to you that I belong here, and this is I'm the person for the job. I still am like that today. Like I I don't want to ever let anybody down, and I don't care if you're intimidating. I will do the best I can, and I will work my butt off for you to prove that I belong and that you made the right decision in hiring me. What were those early years like in Supercross? Again, as you're learning the sport, you're learning the athletes, which again is the job, right? You have to learn the athletes, learn their stories, understand what about them is important so that when you're talking, you're kind of bringing that story to life. What was it like in those early years when you had McGrath and you had you know, that transition into Ricky Carmichael, then James Stewart comes along? I mean, there was, these are like the most iconic people in the sports history and you were right there like during that time I, what what was it like for you as your career is blossoming and these superstars are kind of taking shape it was incredible i mean especially to look back now and realize like that was the era i know everybody says they have their eras and you know there's the rick johnson era i mean you can just name them but i really feel like the jeremy mcgrath the Ricky Carmichael, then Chad Reed comes in and the battles, I mean, it was one was phasing out and the other was coming in and it was just, it was amazing. Like the, the crowds that we had at all the races, getting to talk to these guys, the rivalries that were starting to build, Bubba was unbelievable. Like that kid was just incredible to watch, as you know. I mean, he was checkers or wreckers, as we say in NASCAR, like he was yeah. thin or he was wrecking. And it was just an amazing time in the sport to watch. And um, it's funny, like all the different things that I've covered, IndyCar, freestyle, whatever. I come to NASCAR and I'm like, this is the safest sport I've ever covered. <laughs> People are like, <laughs> what? I'm like, this is the safest sport I've ever covered. The things that I've seen and had to talk about and cover in Supercross, I mean, the danger factor. It, there's just something about that that people are so attracted to. And the, you know, something that I, I still look at now, supercross athletes, is you get to see their entire body. You get to see the athleticism. You know, when a guy's in a race car, you can't see that. You can't see how hard he's working in there. And there's just something so special about that sport. It's crazy how you say that because I, I, I look at it the same way as like we have helmets on in Supercross, right? So you don't get to see the face, but you kind of learn the body structure, the way they ride, how they do it. And again, as you're doing the job, you're seeing James Stewart, like just change the way the whole sport looks. Like he, he just changed everything. And you're seeing like McGrath and Carl, all these names, but then this kid comes in and just changes the whole way it looks. And um, I have to imagine that was pretty cool too, with just his stardom and how he came in and I mean, he was, he was a, he was a game changer. I thought Pastrana kind of had a little bit of that too. Yes. He just wasn't around long enough because of the knees, but um, was that pretty cool during that time for you to watch the sport even go through its big transition? Cause I really feel like James kind of just changed the whole way the sport looked in general, just the way he rode the bike, it, it, everything changed from that point on. And you got to see that happen. Like from 16, I remember when he came out at 16, right. And yeah, like, you got to see all that. Yeah. And I remember Gosh, I don't remember what year it was, but Ricky Carmichael just started making an appearance. He was in one of the, was it Terra Firma? He was in yeah. one of them that everybody's like, oh my God, this is the next kid. And I remember meeting him and he was this little pudgy ball. I'm like, this kid <laughs> is that good? Well, that's when he took it seriously. He got a trainer. And I feel like that was really a changing time in the sport where all of a sudden you had to get a big name trainer and who's training where and who's living in California. And then we're seeing the movement to uh, Florida to be like Ricky Carmichael and train like him and train with somebody like him. 
that was really a, an interesting point, you know, in the sport where we went. Because when I got involved, it was Jeremy McGrath, it was Jeff Emick, they're partying at Lake Havasu. And I'm like, God, when I get older, I want to be like that. I want to be partying <laughs> out there. Like, they're so cool. And then it's like Carmichael came in and then Bubba came in and it just changed. Those partiers were no longer, the sport was real. Jamie, I tell Ricky all the time, he ruined it for everybody. <laughs> he did. He ruined yeah. the sport. It oh was my fun. God. <laughs> and how, about, we... how about Ricky though? Like Pudge Ball to like, he had to work so hard to be the writer that he was. I mean, I give him all the credit in the world. Yeah, hardest worker ever. I mean, like I said, game changer. Um, so again, back to you this time you're doing Supercross. that, I mean, that's where, again, I learned of you cause I was doing it, but then your career goes into different levels at that time. Are you thinking about doing it? Are you at, at that moment ambitiously looking, okay, I want to move on to the next thing or something else or just more things, or did that kind of come on naturally? Like, where did that transition happen for you where it went from Supercross to, I mean, again, the path that led to where you are now. Yeah. Well, it's, I, I would say that most of that credit is on ESPN. So when this all started, I did um, my first like network job. First off, 1998 was the first time I ever did live TV and it was the Daytona Supercross. Mm -hmm. And I remember just shaking in my boots thinking, oh my God, what I say right now, everybody's going to hear. And if I mess up, they're all going to hear it across the country. And going to like Daytona, like International Speedway, I'd never seen such a thing. It was incredible. Little did I know that would become a big part of my future. Yeah. After <laughs> Be there that, a lot, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. A few times? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A few times. Um, so after that, somehow, I don't even remember how it happened, but remember the Gravity Games on NBC? Yeah. So I got chosen to be one of the hosts with Gabrielle Reese and um, Ken and Harkin and Pat, there were like three or four of us on there. Um, so that was my first network job. I still have a copy of the check. We went there for two weeks and it was like when freestyle motocross was really amping up and it was, yeah. you know, Carrie Hart, I did it for two years. Carrie Hart attempted the first backflip. People were breaking themselves left and right. Brian Deegan's getting everybody kicked out of hotels. Like it was a crazy time in the sport. And, you know, from that point on, that's when I found out who to call at ESPN. I'm like, I want to cover Supercross and Motocross, and I want to be on air. This is what I want to do. Finally got the name of the boss of motorsports at ESPN, and his name was Rich Feinberg. I said, you have to hire me. Again, I promise you, I won't let you down. Just give me a shot. He's like, all right, we're going to start with X Games. We'll see how you do. And then from there, literally like, okay, I'm going to do Supercross on air. And then that's when I literally interviewed Aaron Bates on the live to the stadium to take my job as the live announcer. I kind of cho helped choose her. It was such a cool thing to do. And um, so I did TV there and then I did motocross. I did outdoors for one or two seasons. And then I was at Winter X Games and that same boss came to me. He's like, hey, when you get off the air, I need you to come see me in my office. And you're like, oh God, what did I do? What did I say? What did I do? Yeah. I how mean, come it, Jamie, how come it's always, what did I do instead of what could this be? <laughs> yes. Yes. I have to say my boss at Fox, it's like that. It's like, what could this be? Like, it's always, they're always so good, but Rich was a yep. tough one. Like you go back, like people that you were intimidated by. And um, he's like, Hey, um, what do you know about IndyCar racing? I'm like, nothing like my world's two wheels i don't know anything about four but i'm sure i could figure it out it's all racing mentality and he's like we we want to see you do some indie car racing and there's a test next month that we want you to go to so i went to the test next thing i know a month later i'm doing my first pit stop at homestead miami speedway for indycar oh my god it was like i don't know how i survived and didn't fall over and catch on fire um <laughs> And then I was part of like the 8500, like the pre stuff, qualifying and all that. And then they came to me and said, we want you to be part of the 8500. And no woman had ever done that in history of that race. And as you know, I mean, that's the most well-known, yeah. celebrated, legendary race and racetrack ever. And um, I did my first Indy 500 um, in 2004. And it just kind of went from there. And then six, they were getting ready to take the contract for NASCAR back. And everybody was asking me, are you going to do this? Rusty Wallace joined us and he's like, are you going to be part of it? And I just thought, I don't want to be, it, you know, an extra person asking. Everybody wants to be on NASCAR. I don't want to be that person. They'll keep me where they want me. And Rusty Wallace said, squeaky wheel gets the grease. If you want to do it, you need to let them know your intentions. 
And I told them, and a month later they called and said I'm part of the team and that I was even before I mentioned it, but they were happy to know that I wanted it. So that's that's kind of where we are today. It started in 07 and I'm still doing NASCAR now. What was that transition like from two to four wheel, mainly I guess when it comes to the athletes, because you know, access is key, right? You, you know how it is. We got to build these storylines. We need to know these storylines. It's hard to get them sometimes. Sometimes it's easier depending on the athlete. But what was it like going from two, uh, two wheel to four wheel? Because I know the worlds are so much different in just how they operate. I, I had a chance to go to an IndyCar last year and just hang out with Lee Diffie and kind of watch how it's done. And it, I, I couldn't believe how much different it was. Did you find it challenging going from the Supercross world to that four-wheel world where everything was different, especially after you had already kind of developed like your systems? Now you're going into a completely different world. Did, did you find that challenging? For sure. I had to learn everything. I mean, everything. And everywhere I could go to racing school so that I could feel it myself. I think I did five racing schools. Um, I even got my racing license just to prove like that I understood and I felt it. I mean, I, I'm a racer. I love, I love anything like that. Um, and then getting to know the drivers, same thing, anywhere they were going, any way I can talk to them, I would. The very cool thing, and I still give it credit to this day, is that a lot of those guys watched Supercross, so they knew who I was, especially when I came into NASCAR. And that was a huge help. It wasn't like I was some new face, new female in the garage, like, what, are, what is she doing? Who does she work for? A lot of them knew me from Supercross. So automatically, there was like a common interest. And then you could jump into like, tell me about your world. What should I be watching? And, and kind of built it from there. I mean, it was literally organic. That's all you can do is just pay, you know, pay your dues, you know, work your butt off. That's all you could do. And that's, that's what it took to get here. You know, when it comes to getting those storylines and, and building these relationships, which you build over time, like you said, it, obviously the Supercross thing helped the NASCAR because they knew who you were, but you still had to build those relationships not everyone's the same. Some are harder than others. Mm -hmm. How have you approached an athlete that is harder to get to and to crack? Like, for, I'm lucky with Jason Anderson. I'm his friend, but he's hard for some to get what you want out of him because he doesn't want to give you that much. There's athletes that are like that. Yeah. How have you been able to kind of go about that strategically when there is someone that's harder to get to, but you know you've got to do it. you got to respect the boundaries, but you got to get what you need. How do you approach that? I, I, that's it's still difficult for me sometimes. Again, I'm a racer, so it's a little bit different. But how was that for you when you would have a, a tough one that just didn't want to give, give the info up? Yeah, I don't think it was ever as hard as it was once I came over to NASCAR. And I've definitely had my moments, you know, with Kurt Busch, Kyle Busch, Tony Stewart, Kevin Harvick. I mean, I've had those moments with all of them, but I'm kind of hard-headed myself. And you know, at ESPN, it was more, I mean, they would push us on news, like something happened to him last week, you've got to ask him about it right now. And I got burned doing that a couple of times until I realized, you know what, I'm the face of all of us right now. And if I look like an ass, we're all going to look like an ass. So I learned to trust my instinct. And I really have learned to rely on that. Go with your gut and know when the when the situation is right to ask a certain question that's maybe uncomfortable or tough and make sure that it's the right time. That's really helped guide me in those ways. I think um, just my longevity in the sport, you know, you just have to build that rapport, build that mutual respect. I think first and foremost is those riders or drivers, they see you paying your dues and, and doing the research in the garage and they notice when they don't see you in the garage, they know who does their homework and who doesn't. And that that's a huge difference when you go to interview somebody. They give you that respect that they know you're trying to get something from them. So they'll give you something or they'll totally blow you off. Like we see happen a lot with, with maybe, you know, local anchors that they don't know and maybe ask a question they think is probably not the smartest. Um, so yeah, it's fun. It's challenging. But I've had moments on TV where I'm like, are you serious? Like, are we going to do this right now? <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I imagine, again, over time, you build that trust, you build that rapport, so it gets better. But I have to imagine the beginning, that was tough, because not only were you learning a new sport, um, you were learning the, all the backstory, but you had to learn their personalities, too, right? Like, some athletes, I mean, they'll give you everything. Like, Travis Pastrana. It, it, yeah. Is there, are you going to have a hard time with him? No, he will tell you every. He's just Travis. But there are some that maybe don't want to give it and they maybe you have to earn it or maybe they just don't like talking. And 
was it tough though in the beginning sometimes when you would have that with someone that again you're trying to respect them yes. at the same time like you you said you're hard-headed you got to just sometimes just say like look I got a job to do like yeah. come on I mean did, did yeah. you ever have to get a little like come on with somebody yeah I I mean Kevin Harvick I was forced to push him on this issue of something that had happened the previous week and and uh he kind of said something on the air and it just kind of made me look like an ass and it made him look like an ass. And I called him right after the race. And I was like, if you have a problem with me, you handle it off air. You don't do that on national TV. And we we're like, all right. And nothing ever, you know, no problems ever again. And I think if, if you have conversations with people that maybe you don't see eye to eye with, um, or they feel like you attacked them or didn't ask the proper question, um, you make sure you talk it out because that stuff comes across on the air. And it, you mentioned somebody that was hard. I remember in Supercross, one person that that was difficult to pull things out of. Always great, but hard to get to talk was Mike LaRocco. I'm like, hmm, what are we going to talk about here? He just does not want to talk. And then you had, you know, Bubba and then you had Pastrana that just loved to talk and would say whatever you know, any, any time. Emig was tough sometimes too. He could be smart alecky. Mm -hmm. He, he, he still can be. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he's Jeff. He's, he's yeah. just depending on what mood he's in. But yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah I, I've learned that too throughout this whole process is that I, it's, I've had to tell one writer in particular, I, and I don't want to say the name, it wouldn't be fair, but I had to tell him like, sit, look, I'm, I can essentially be your television brand manager. I can make you look really good if you give me the information and I will relay that. Or you can just not give me anything and be stubborn about it. And then I'm just going to have to say what I see. And if it doesn't look good and I don't know the story, I might make you look bad. And it's not my fault. I'm doing my job. Like, just give me a little bit. And it took about a year for me to finally break them down to where now I get all the info and I'm able to kind of do my job. But I have to imagine again, like how difficult that is at different times and just learning those personalities and who's going to give you a hard time and who's not going to yeah. give you a hard time. But I would imagine now with you being in the position you've been with your history and your accomplishments that I would imagine that's gone away a little bit. Are, are they more like looking forward to talking to you now and, and less, less about being willing and more like excited to tell you things and talk to you now because you built that, that history. Yeah, I, I don't know if anybody's excited, but I mean, yes, it's like, friends. oh, hey, Jamie wants to talk to me today. You know, that's such a great place to be, but that takes a long, long time, a lot of years and, you know, a lot of interviews to get to that point. And I look forward to it. I love interviewing people. That is like, that is my favorite part of the job. And that's why I don't see myself ever coming off pit road and just doing the booth because I really love talking to people. Um, but yeah, it, it definitely, it's not always that way. I think I see other people coming up in the sport and I'm like, I know it's, it's tough and it's, you just cringe because you're like, I know the situation they're in. Um, another part of my job, you know, I get the stories a lot of the time from my crew chiefs. So I talk to my crew chiefs on Sunday morning or Saturday morning, whatever races I'm covering. And crew chiefs can be tough because they're engineers. And you're trying to pull stuff out of them and we're not practicing we're not qualifying this year so you're trying to find anything to tell yeah. stories on somebody so you really have to get good at asking the right questions and um you know in the moment and i think the same on air you you just have to find the right moment to ask the right question but let me ask you a question about networks and this is this is because something that's new that i'm dealing with when i first started doing tv we were with fox then it switched to NBC. So I've dealt with two different networks now that have their own, I don't say vision is the word, but their own, like who they are, what they stand for, what they like, how they like things called. And I've had to kind of learn that they're different and it's made me adjust. You worked, you said ESPN with Fox, you've, you've had that experience. Um, how was that like for you experiencing different networks and different producers that have their own vision and the way they like to do things. And then you got to still be you, Jamie, you have to be you, but you also have to kind of follow under their vision. I guess I'll use the word. So yeah. how has that been for you over the years? And, and was it difficult? Was it, did you enjoy that challenge? Cause I, I'm, I'm kind of going through that now. I, I'm going to the first time ever the, the Fox to NBC change was, was definitely different for me. Yes, I agree. Um, going from ESPN to Fox was a huge change. ESPN, from what I understand, is similar to NBC, you know, buttoned up, more corporate. ESPN was so good at teaching me to be a reporter. They would send us all to Hartford, Connecticut to go through these training seminars, learn how to ask questions, learn how to interview. That was everything. 
I mean, first and foremost, if you're interviewing somebody, ask a question, don't make a statement. I mean, it was simple things like that that you don't even think about that they right. really helped me to be who I am. And then Rich Feinberg, my boss that I mentioned that I cold called, he was my boss until 2014, my last year with ESPN. And he was hard on me, but he, he believed in me and he pushed me. He would call me out when I was doing something out of line that he didn't think was right. Get your nose out of the shop, back up, ask him this, what are you thinking? <laughs> um, and I wore a fire suit. Like they were like, it's about the, the event. It's not about you. You're gonna be branded in a fire suit. That was their vision. And, and that's all I knew. And I loved that. It was very corporate. Um, then I come over to Fox and they're like, you're not wearing a fire suit. Um, you could wear whatever you want. I'm like, what? I don't know my identity on TV without a fire suit. I mean, I literally went through this transition of who, like, who am I on TV? What do I wear? Um, and now I can show personality and be more of who I am. Fox is awesome. If I started at Fox and went to ESPN, it would have been a, a lot harder transition because Fox hired me to be who I am and who I was at ESPN. You know your deal. We're not gonna teach you anything new. We're hiring you to be you. And um, it's a great fit for me. I mean, it's still small almost. I mean, we're, we're not small, but we are. And my bosses call me like the night before an ARCA race, Jamie, just wanna wish you good luck. Go hit it out of the park. Like that's just amazing. And it builds that camaraderie and relationship. Yeah, it's crazy you say that. It's like almost like the ESPN, that, that being hard on you, being critical, having a very formal structure probably like just sharpened your skill set early and, and then set you on your way. And then you go to Fox and then you kind of got to explore maybe who you were more and I guess develop more individually. Does that yeah. make sense? Like you got yeah. to become yourself more, but you had all that skill set and training from the harder years in the beginning. Is that, is that my on to something? Yeah, else? yeah, exactly. You, so it was a lot easier to do that. I did all my growth and building and becoming who I am as a journalist and, um, and then I got to become who I truly am outside of racing, but on TV. And, and it was an interesting transition, but it's, it's, been, it's been great. It's a really good place to be. I know you got to be with Fox for a while. And that was the crazy thing, Daniel. Like I got hired by Fox and my first job, and this is just, you know, like ESPN believed in me as a pit reporter. Like you are a good pit reporter. We're going to keep you there. Like we're not putting you in any other roles and, and that's fine. But I go to Fox, first thing they do after NASCAR season's over, my first job for them, hey, we want you to be part of Supercross again. Um, we want you to host the live show. And I was like, I've never hosted a show. I haven't done Supercross in eight years. Okay. I was so nervous at Anaheim. I was like, I know this stuff, but this is my first gig with Fox. I don't want to choke here doing something brand new. And it was awesome. And they let me do that, um, you know, for a couple of years. And I'm sad we're not doing it right now, hopefully in the future. That was cool. I, what, I mean, I guess I'll ask now because I don't know. But what was the method behind that? Because they didn't do it all the time, but they had that role where, like, I remember, like, you hosted the whole thing, but then it kind of sent down, but then it kind of came back. What, what was the method with that? I, they didn't do that all the time. That, that's not normal for Supercross. Yeah, there were just certain events that they would have a pre-show, you know, that I was able to still do my NASCAR duties for Cup and not miss that stuff. I remember doing a couple Supercross races on Saturday night and then like rushed out and showed up on Sunday morning to cover the race. And it was awesome to do that because then everybody's like, I just saw you on Supercross. So what'd you think of this? And they want to talk about it. And um, it was so much fun. But yeah, it was just kind of special events they would have me do. And then, of course, Ricky being part of it and you being part of it. Yep. And um, I remember having Jeremy on set to interview him. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is just the best. It was so much fun. And Ricky, Ricky hates when I talk about Jeremy, but I can't help it. <laughs> <laughs> I, we, we know we mess with Ricky on that all the time. It's fun. Um, so I got a question for you because this is another thing that I am experiencing. Um, I'm critical of myself. I want to be great. I always want to be better. I don't believe you ever have a perfect show. Like I'm very critical. So I go back and watch how did you handle that scenario with yourself and get better? Because people can give you notes, like you've gotten notes, I'm sure before, and you're like, okay, yeah, yeah. But that self-critique, like how do you evaluate yourself to continue to get better, even after everything that you've done, I know you still want more. How do you find your faults now after having the amount of reps you've had and after you polished everything so good, 
knowing you still can find something more, how, how do you do it? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, in the beginning, like you, I would watch stuff, I watch it back and be like, wow, I could be better there. And now I don't watch my stuff back when it comes to pit reporting, because I know, I know when I nail it, I know when I mess up, I keep little notes, like as I go, like, oh, I need to find this out, or I need to get, like, say this better or do this better. Um, I know when I nail something or when I was kind of shaky on something, but ARCA, now that it's new, of course, I watch that back and I critique the hell out of myself. And I'm like, <laughs> oh my gosh, like this sounded, you know, worse than I thought it did, or this was better actually than it felt, you know, it felt like it was 15 seconds of not talking, but it actually was good. And, um, so it's fun. You have to watch yourself, I think, in new roles to really build like who you are and, and what you're doing and, and little tiny things that you can make yourself better by. And, and that's kind of where I'm at right now, too, with ARCA. So I, I did the play-by-play -play at Salt Lake, which was my first time ever. I got dropped in just a, a one race deal. And I've watched it back now like three or four times. And each time I felt different about it. The first one, I was like, oh, this is so bad. My voice sounds horrible. And then the second time I was like, this is really good. I actually did better than I thought. And then the third time it went back to horrible. And so I've been doing this like, I don't know if it's just an emotional dance or whatever, but I feel like I found that I'm probably right in the middle somewhere. But yeah. are you having those moments too, where you watch back and you're like, oh, that was horrible. And then you watch back, and you're like, no, that was actually really good. Like you're almost like you're playing tricks with your own mind because I probably just the self critique, but I feel like I'm playing tricks on myself watching back. Oh yeah. I mean, just coming off the air, I'm just like, oh my God, I don't know what that looked like. Or, you know, I, I don't know. And then I'll hear from my boss, like that was your best race yet. And I'm like, oh, okay. It must've been good. <laughs> and then I'll watch and I'm like, oh my gosh, I definitely did not nail that opening or, you know, yes, totally. It's, it's your, I guess it's the moment that you're in that you're watching it. It's the mood that you're in. It's the feedback you're getting. I mean, one comment from somebody that matters to you could just send you into a tailspin like, oh man, why did I even push for this job? Why don't I just stick to what I know? <laughs> <laughs> how come it, How come a hundred positive comments can't outweigh one negative? And not from like a, just a random internet person. Like I don't even, I don't know about you, but I don't, yeah, those no. don't exist. But someone important, like if someone's like, eh, one of those is worth more than a hundred good ones for some reason. It's like, I, I don't know. It's, I don't know if we're just, cause we're, we care probably. So, yeah. but I don't know if it's like that for you, but one critical comment can make me feel so bad. That's what you it would think take a hundred to make up the difference. Yeah. Well think about this. You guys as athletes, you don't remember the races you won. You remember the races you lost, yeah. right? Those are the ones that, that you beat your head up against the wall. Like Kyle Busch, the worst thing is getting, after the race, the short straw I always say is having to interview Kyle Busch when he finishes second. You can interview him when he's third or fourth and when he wins, he's awesome. But when he finishes second, like whoever has to interview him is, that's the short straw. It is the worst place for him to finish. And those are the ones he remembers. Probably again, back to just passionate. When you care a lot, those things are gonna hit you harder than the ones you win. The ones you win, you kind of like expect, or. If you do a really good job on TV, you're like, okay, that's what I expected myself. I work hard, but whenever you mess up, you're just, ah. Um, yes, so that's so I, I cool. Want... I'm sorry, I didn't see um, Salt Lake when you did that. That's really awesome. Oh, it was, uh, it was crazy. So Todd Harris, had he was double booked. He had to go to Bermuda. Uh, and I want to talk about Todd here in a second. Um, so I got a chance to do it. And it was my first one ever. It was live TV, wearing the suit. Uh, me and Ricky, which obviously with Ricky made it very comfortable. He's my friend. So yeah. I just relied on like my comfort with him. But like you, it was just all the other stuff outside of the racing that was a hard, the, the commercials, the, the playbacks, all that kind of stuff that I'd never done. And I had Bondo there and Bondo was great with me. He, I have a good relationship with him, but I feel like the actual race call wasn't bad it was everything else that was stressful did, yeah. did you kind of feel that the first time too like once the racing was on it was on you know it you you, you research but it was all the other like silly yeah. responsibilities that no one really pays attention to that for me was brutal it was yeah. so hard that exactly i mean once the green flag waves you're like all right now we're just shooting the breeze with some buddies talking about the race yeah. and all of a sudden your producer 
in your ear. I'm like, what, why are you interrupting? We're giving you a countdown. You're going to break. When we come back here, we're going to this feature. And then you need to mention this. You need to read this card. And it's like, okay, let me just call the race. Now I, I love the challenge, but yes, that's exactly, those are the moments that are different and stressful. And you're trying to make the easy transition from chatting with Ricky to we're going to break. And then having to fill 10 seconds worth of something while they're counting down. I, yes. I, I told Bondo, like, I don't mind it because I like to know, but at the same time in the moment, it was definitely tougher when he was seven, six, five. And I'm trying to just like kind of fluff my way out and just hype up the next segment. And uh, it, it was like, like you said, it was challenging. Like, I love that challenge, but it was, it was a little heavier than I thought it was going to be. It was, it was pretty tough, but okay. So I want to talk about Todd Harris really quickly and then we'll start winding down. But I love Todd. Um, he was calling the racing when I was starting out. So I remember him. And when I found out he was doing Supercross this year, I was just stoked because it's it was Todd. Yeah. So I got to know him this year and went to dinner with him a bunch. He's the greatest dude ever. Um, what was it like for you working with Todd? Because that was that was a different Todd back then. Like he's done so much now. But what was it like just for you working with Todd Harris? Gosh, I worked with Todd in Supercross. I worked with them at X Games. I worked with them in IndyCar. The dude can do everything. He's one of those play-by-play -play guys that just pisses you off because he remembers everything. He is everything. witty. Yes, they're witty. It's like, it's something you have to have as play-by-play -play, is you have to be witty. You have to have this photographic memory. It just makes you so mad because I am like notes for days and like, I remember what I write down and that's it. I'll forget about last week's race like the next day. Um, but Todd was always so good. And I swear the dude does not age. Like he is the same no. Todd I worked with 15 years ago. He is. And for me, it, he's, he's got this crazy infectious personality. That's like happy and like up tempo. Like I always feel like he's just, he gets me revved up every time I'm with him. Even if we're just getting like some barbecue in Dallas, like he just, I don't know. So I was just curious of what it was like. Cause we went to dinner this year. We talked about you. We were just talking about times and he mentioned you. And I was like, I just, again, I had like these weird deja vu feelings because I'm remembering myself wearing LBZ gear racing Supercross <laughs> and there's Todd and Robbie Floyd and Cameron Steele and then there was you and then there was Aaron Bates and it's like, for me, those were like my, my racing years. So I have like this special place in my memory because I would watch every single race as a racer and a fan. And so I just, I, I was just curious of what it was like working with all of them at that time. It just, again, just a, such yeah. a cool time in the sport and a cool time in your career. Yes, it was. Um, Todd is like a big kid. He was always a big kid. So fun. Um, heck, when I started, Daniel, it was Art Ekman and David Bailey. Like we did the yep. World Supercross GP in Spain and Arnhem Holland. Oh, and I remember like, the first like online, like, I don't even know what you called it back then, but it, it was like the live Supercross on the internet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and me and Art Ekman did the call together. And I have a picture like with the headset being an analyst. And I just look back, like we had some amazing times. We got to see the world because of Supercross and just the personalities, people like Todd and, and just who was racing at the time. Like it doesn't get better than that. And it's really cool. You mentioned like that moment of our lives, like how cool it was. I still to this day get fans at NASCAR. They're like, I watched you in Supercross or I get kids that say, my mom and dad love you in Supercross. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, cool, thanks. <laughs> I know, but it's just, you know, that was just a pivotal time, I think in, in motocross and the whole era of racing. So now that you are where you're at, again, still accomplishing new things, new opportunities, um what what is there anything you want to do like you said it sounds like you're up for anything and everything but is there anything specific that you're like I do want to do that like that like a box that hasn't been checked yet is there is there anything out there that's funny I I was always asked about that and I always say I I love doing pit reporting like that's my thing I I never aspired to go into the booth but now that I'm in the booth it kind of answers your question that that is something I would like to to do. Sometimes I'm like, no, I don't. I have two small kids. I have four dogs. I have a family. I have franchises. I can't do anymore, but I just do because I love it so much. And I want to help pave the way for the next generation, more women that love the sport like I do, that love racing like I do, to show that we can do it. 
Um, I feel like it's my responsibility. And if I'm asked to do it, then I must be the person for the job. So I, I would love to do a series, you know, whether it's like the truck series or Xfinity, that would be great. If I don't ever get there, I am happy as a clam just getting to at least try it and do reps with ARCA, but I get to cover everything as a pit reporter. And I, I just, it doesn't get better than that. Do you, and, and since you said it, do you feel like you are paving the way for women to be able to have more responsibilities and take on those different roles um, now that you are the one? To, I mean, I'm assuming in the beginning it was like cool for you individually, but is there that added, uh, not a responsibility, but a little bit of an added pressure to, hey, I really want to pave the way so that behind me, more women do have an opportunity to do these things. Do you kind of feel that now? Yeah, I did from, from the first time they told me I had this job, I started realizing like, cause everybody gets hung up on the whole history thing. You're the first woman to do it. I'm like, that's great and all, but what comes of that is what we do going forward. And I know there are a lot of women, more women now than when I started and I loved racing. Women realize like you could have a career in this job. If you want to be a reporter for racing, you can do it. If you want to be a play-by-play, -play, you know, or analyst for television for racing, you can do it. And I think the biggest thing is why I was even more nervous doing my first race was because I wanted to prove to producers, whether it's NBC or it's Fox, that women are just as capable and people are willing to listen and they like that and enjoy it as long as it's somebody that knows what the hell they're talking about. They can be hired. So that's what I hope comes of this. And, and to be the first one is awesome. And, and you said responsibility. I totally see it as a responsibility to do well, to work my butt off and, and pay it forward. Well, Jamie, that's very inspirational. And I'm just, again, so excited that you were able to take some time. I know you're super busy. You're just crazy. But I, I just want to thank you for coming on Beyond the Track. Um, I look forward to doing this. I had a lot of fun with you and I hope to see you soon too. So hopefully when the world, we get all back to normal again, we can see it super cross. I know you went to one this year, but I, you know, where we weren't able to intermingle yeah. as much as we had in the past. So hopefully as things get normal, I get to see you soon. We need to get you to a NASCAR race, by the way. Well, I have a beard right now and I'd like to keep it. So I'd like to come as a fan. Maybe I can come and shadow you. I got a chance to do that with Lee Diffie and IndyCar. So you let me know if there's one available and I will come out and I will hang out. I would love to do yeah, that. Yeah, let's do but it. But I get to keep the beard though, right? Yeah, totally. Summer beard. No masks now. So you can rock the beard and you could follow me around. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Well, Jamie, thanks again for coming on Beyond the Track and I hope to see you soon. Thanks for having me.